you can go to most places and they have a beginner line or you know they have a intermediate line something for people to progress on if you can if your imagination runs a little bit it's uh surprising what you could do there's not that like hard entry like you're not good enough to mountain bike like you know you can be good enough because we have these trails for people to progress on i started out racing motocross at the age of five been riding bicycles basically my whole life and uh raced for i still still do a little bit of racing but um it's been a life of two wheels that's for sure and i about four years ago now i started taking mountain biking more seriously and uh it's led me down a really interesting path of just meeting a lot of awesome people and uh I'm just, I'm stoked to be a part of the mountain bike community. And we have a good one here in Cleveland, Ohio. When, when you don't think of Cleveland, you don't think of Cleveland as a mountain biking haven, um, but we do have uh, a place called Ray's MTB, um, which people travel all over the world to come to. And uh, it's uh, pretty special to have something like that around here. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a cool community. That's for sure. Yeah, if you're watching the video stream, I actually have the Ray's park playing on a tv up here so you can kind of see i assume that's you ripping around just this this massive indoor park and kind of what that's all about it, it looks really cool even as you know a novice like myself i could probably rip around some of that oh for sure and you know there there's so many families that come and bring their little ones and there's there's kids on strider bikes and um there's you know like the 500 dollars specialized that you were talking about um there's a lot of those out there too so um that's that's what's cool i mean you know that barrier to entry once you can get over that into mountain biking like you don't have to have the best bike out there to go have a good time on the trails <clears throat> and that that might be a good transition because as you said the midwest or at least where i am in lower michigan and you in ohio you, you as you said you don't think of that as mountain biking areas but if you just go and search mountain biking in your area i will almost guarantee there's some park some trail even just like a pavement path or something you can bike on within an hour of you uh there's one up right up the road for me and yeah i got i got my bike down when i was living in kentucky for a minute which is a mountain biking mecca yeah and just bought the cheapest thing i had because i was broke and just have been beating the hell out of that it's it's probably one of my favorite sports that and snowboarding uh because you are you can't be distracted you can't be on your phone you can't be you can barely be listening to music at least i can't uh because you have to be aware of your surroundings and you're so intently in this that if you mess up you're gonna hurt yourself so that's like the the fun and the draw of it to me mm -hmm. um but i guess this whole rant is just to say that even with a you know hundred dollar walmart bike you can get started mountain biking by just finding some trails in your area yeah exactly and you know so i originally grew up near the youngstown ohio area and i mean really it was it was like you just said i grew up about an hour from any trailhead and anywhere decent was at least an hour and a half or two hours so um you know we just made do there was you know, we lived uh near a lake and there was some decent dirt down there and a couple people just made a path down there and i'm like this is kind of fun. So we call it the lollipop loop and it's, it's the flattest trail you've ever seen, but you know, we, we kind of, we, we feel like we're, uh, you know, pros just going super fast on the flat ground when we were, uh, growing up a little bit. And <clears throat> that's probably like what sparked the interest in mountain biking for me is like, it's super fun going through the trees like that. And, um, like you said, you just have to be in the moment all the time. And, uh, I think that's what makes it special. And, uh, you know, growing up uh, with nothing to ride, um, you kind of just have to, your imagination has to work a little bit. And uh, yeah, it, like you said, we just make the best of it. Did you start on any fancy bike or anything, or was it just a hand-me-down from your parents or something? Uh, I started, uh, I got, my one buddy let me ride. It was a I don't even, I guess you would, I don't even know what you would call it. It was a hard tail and a hard front. Uh, so I guess just a full rigid bike with gears. And he took me to this trail that's about like 45 minutes or an hour from me. 
And uh, that's where I got my first experience. And then I went down to my local bike shop and bought a Trek. I don't remember what model it was, but it was about like $400 and I beat the crap out of that thing. And uh, like you said, like bending axles and you, you just start going through it to the point where you're like, all right, this is probably the time where like, if I want to take this, you know, to it, to the next level, I'm going to have to probably get a little bit of a better bike and uh, help, help me progress to that next level. And I, I guess the last thing I'll say before, before we dive into kind of what you do for work is you, okay. you can be a pro or a beginner getting into mountain biking and you can approach any trail however you want. If you have to walk up the hill, who cares? If you have to walk down the hill, who cares? You know, there's going to be a section of that where you're you're really pushing yourself as a beginner. Uh, obviously, there's some trails in my experience that are just totally crazy and, and you should probably yeah. avoid them altogether. But typically, when you go to any location that has mountain bike paths, there's stuff for every skill level. And I, I just think that's super cool for you know, for people wanting to get into it. And you, as someone who's probably much more experienced than I am, you can go to the most boring trail in the world and have a complete riot because you just hit it faster, you hit it differently, and it, it doesn't really matter what the path looks like. Any experience level can can enjoy it. Yeah, and like touching back on, you know, letting your imagination run a little bit, uh, that's kind of, some people are like, ask like how how did you put that together or how did you do that on this type of trail like i would never think to do something like that like you know like doing like some little jibby manuals or like little nose bonks here and there um but if you can if your imagination runs a little bit it's uh surprising what you could do with like either just a flat trail or just you know something with not a lot of features but um going back to like mountain biking in general that's that is like what you said like how cool it is that you can go to most places and they have a beginner line or, you know, they have a intermediate line, something for people to progress on. And, um, I think, I think that's awesome as well. Like that's, that's one of the reasons that I kind of fell in love with it because there's not that like hard entry, like you're not good enough to mountain bike. Like, you know, you can be good enough because we have these trails for people to progress on. I love that. So let's let's kind of go back to your introduction and and understand what you do for work. You work out of this this Rise Indoor Park, and you do some other stuff that you know that that really shows your commitment to biking. Yeah, so um, I work a full time job. I'm working forty to fifty hours a week, and then uh, I also do some coaching at Rays MTB and in the general Cleveland area. And, uh, yeah, so I, uh, coach, I've coached kids as young as six or seven years old and, uh, up to 60. So I've worked with a wide range of clients and, uh, I don't like to call them clients They're I, I call them riders, you know, you, you gotta, uh, kind of stick to, uh, you know, try to make it sound cooler than like, I got clients, but, uh, no, uh, I, I'm very, uh, thankful to work with everyone I work with and, uh, seeing some serious results. So there's some kids that like, it just makes my day when I'll, I'll see them at Rays again. And, uh, they're like, dude, like you taught me how to jump my first jump or, you know, I'm, I'm clearing this line now because we worked on this. And, uh, that is what keeps my passion going. Like I, I have a burning passion for helping people uh, on the bike and off the bike as well. And uh, so I, that's uh, that's one of my things I have going on outside of my my day job. Um, and then I also do some social media influencing and uh, content creation for a few brands within the mountain bike space and uh, make some uh, content for my own pages. So definitely, uh, definitely busy lately, but it's all super fulfilling to me and I'm um, thankful to be doing it all. Very cool. What, what type of things are, are people coming to you for coaching on? Cause you know, as we just kind of explained, you can enter this with, with almost nothing, but I would have to imagine that bringing on a coach, you know, having somebody to guide you through some of these different paths and whatever could really level you up quickly. Yeah, it, it depends. Um, I think the, honestly, the most I get asked about is jumping like, Hey, I'd like to learn how to jump. Um, or even like pumping, like I'm not maintaining my speed well enough or like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm kind of lacking in the corners. So I'll kind of take that, 
general, you know, generalization, like jumping or pumping or cornering. And I'll try to, to broaden it. So like a couple things we work on. So like, if we're going to do a jump lesson, um, I usually try to work even <clears throat> on like jump preparation. So how are we going to approach this jump or how are we going to have the speed to not think about it when we're going off the lip? Cause I think what a lot of people struggle with, um, especially while jumping is they don't have good jump preparation. Like, did they have enough speed going into the lip or did they look ahead enough while they're cornering to kind of think about the jump and all these things, uh, translate into, you know, having a good time in the air or a bad time. So, um, yeah, it's definitely, it's, uh, it's, it's super cool to see people just progress at their own level. Like, especially with my guidance. I'm starting to play around with and get playful. Uh, you know, normally sometimes you see jumps on the path and you have jump or flat round and you just, you, you pick your, your poison half the time I go on the, the flat ground, but if I'm yeah. really in the zone, adrenaline's pump in, I might hit some of the little, little jumps. So I definitely see that as a way to maybe improve your experience and get more playful. Uh, and then I also know that every time I start off a season, you're, you have to kind of get your, your legs back, your, your confidence back. So those that like loose gravel, those tight turns, all that stuff is just so skittish for me when I get going. Um, I mean, are those common things that people come to you with and you you kind of work work on them with? Yeah. So obviously I work with those um, general, you know, tips like how to jump better, uh, et cetera. But the, the one of the things I, I feel like I kind of differentiate myself with than other coaches. I, I, I really like to try to work on confidence. I, mm -hmm. that's super important to me. And I I've been in this mental state before where I've actually had crashes before from me just kind of like slipping mentally, just a touch. And that's enough to, to go into a bad scenario. Um, so I actually, a lot of my riders that I work with, I honestly, before we drop in, um, I'm like, Hey, listen, focus and just tell yourself like I could do this like if you're a little bit nervous or um I think confidence is one of the biggest um determining factors if you're going to make a jump or you know if you're ready to do the jump in general and if you're not confident let's not do it it's very funny that you you bring that up the the thing that I'm trying to achieve with this channel is to kind of convince people to push themselves and I've been listening to some some podcasts and reading some books and stuff where it's just, it's talking about people getting out of their comfort zone, trying new things, pushing themselves. And, and I don't know the, 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 the people that like challenges and like doing hard things are kind of what I'm trying to highlight here. So I love that you're doing that, especially from a young age with these people that are, you know, just, just trying to find an outlet, I guess. Um, yeah, I guess, is there anything you want to ramble on with that whole confidence thing? Um, yeah, so I actually have a recent example. I was working with this younger kid. He was eight years old, and it was, it was actually kind of funny. So I um, ended up arriving at the bike park, and he already had, like, a Band-Aid on his chin. I'm like, oh, dude, like, how, how did you – did you already take a spill today? He's like, yeah, I fell back here. I'm like, oh man, like that, that's a bummer. So like we we're going into this lesson with his confidence was super low. Um, and we just progressively built it throughout the session. I'm like, dude, you, you did awesome on that. Like, it's just those little wins. So if you could focus on those little wins and just build those up and keep building those, um, that's what is going to carry you to being confident, to, confident enough to do anything. I mean, so that's another thing that has really helped in my daily life as well. Um, those little wins, like even if you don't say, for instance, this is a kind of a weird example, but this is what came to mind. Like, like, uh, I don't want to take the garbage out, like whatever, like I'll just do it tomorrow. But like, even if you do that, guess what? Now you don't have to take it out the next day and you can try to do something else like with that little bit of time or like that little, like you're putting yourself ahead, just little, little wins every single day. I think that's kind of the what Atomic Habits book, you know, just just start moving on something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you are doing kind of some sponsor yeah, sponsorship work. Has that taken you anywhere around the country? Has that allowed you to do anything unique or 
I guess what's that relationship like? Yeah. Um, so I started out with my social media pages. Um, and I was like, you know, let's, uh, let's see what we could do. I always enjoyed like making content and it, it's kind of amazing just, you know, putting yourself, like just making that decision. Like I'm going to just keep doing this for a while and see what happens. And I started to gain some traction. Like I'd get like, so let's say some discount codes, things like that. Like that, this is how, you know, small of a level we started on. Like, oh, like, I, and then I got like my first little bit of free product. I'm like, this is awesome. And uh, then I recently, I, this has been going for about uh, two years now, like this content journey. And this year um, I've gotten flown out to two different bike fests and um i'm even getting some monetary value from a couple of the companies i work with uh, making some content so it's it's amazing like if you just push yourself out of that comfort zone like i just started my own business as well it's uh it's called shrout mtb and uh, it's my coaching service and uh, social media services and uh like if you just if you put your mind to uh to it and just do it like it, it's pretty impressive what you could do with yourself. Um, I was always kind of the person that was like, ah, like, I don't know if I could do that. Like, I don't know if I can accomplish that, but I kind of had a mindset switch, you know, like I said, maybe like a year or two ago and, um, yeah, put yourself out there and just, just do it and see what happens. You know, what were the events that you got flown out to? Um, I ended up going out to the Bentonville Bike Fest, which is a huge uh, bike fest down in Bentonville, Arkansas. And I went out to meet up with one of my sponsors and we went to an event called um, Sky Park Bike Fest. And it's super cool. Um, it's actually like Christmas themed. So the whole park like has candy canes and stuff. And it was an old amusement park back in the day. And like, it's kind of cool. So like one of the old rides, they turned into like a bike roller coaster. So you get on a mountain bike and like you ride it down this uh, like little old roller coaster, which is kind of cool, but it was a super rad event. Um, and it was like, it was all the locals too. So I got to like connect with that community out there when I was in California as well. And, um, yeah, it's, it was, uh, it was super, uh, I can't think of the word right now, but, um, it was super, fulfilling i guess we'll we'll say for for me being able to to do something like that after just like my you know short stint in the content uh, making so and i i would have to imagine that those are pretty large events in the the mountain biking scene can you can you maybe explain what those events look like how many people attend and and whatnot i've had a couple episodes where i've brought specific guests on to talk about an event so mm -hmm. I'm actually I'm very curious about, you know, who, who flew in? Did they fly in from around the world? Was it just like a big jam sash? Was it competitive? Um, and, and for those of you who don't know Bentonville, Bentonville, I've actually heard of it. And I'm just a, a scrub. Like, it's in Arkansas. It's this, I would say, world-renowned mountain bike park. If you get a chance to check it out, it's, it's wild. They build all these crazy jumps and banks, and they have a pump track, and I don't know. It's nuts. I went out there just to visit some friends and had a total riot. And it's the home of Walmart. So there we go. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so Bentonville, that was definitely the biggest bike fest I, I went to. Um, uh, it's There's got to be probably close to upwards to 20,000 people at least there. I, if I had to guess, I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, but actually it, it was kind of crazy at that event. Day three got completely wiped out. Um, there was a tornado that went through and just ripped everyone's tents to shreds. And like, there was trees down everywhere. It was, it was crazy. I've never seen anything like it. We were staying like 15 minutes from, from the event. And, uh, we're glad it didn't tear up the Airbnb we were in as well, but um, all of our merchandise got trashed and, um, yeah, it was, it was super sad and heartbreaking for the local community when that happened. Um, but yes, uh, going back to some, like some of the events, uh, the sky park bike fest I went to, that was more of a local event. Um, so there was, there was a little bit of a uh, little less people, but there was still some, uh, super, super cool bike, uh, companies there. And, um, yeah, it was, it was kind of like, a wholesome community vibe there um 
but uh, a couple, I have plans to go out to a couple more this coming year. And there's one called Sea Otter and it's like the biggest uh, mountain bike and cycling trade show there, there is in the U S um, that's out in California. And um, I might potentially go to Sedona, Arizona as well. There's a, there's another decent sized bike fest out there. So how, how, what is like the entry level for these events? Cause when you get into mountain biking, you have access to all these free parks in your area in your local area, or, or you have to pay your, you know, state park pass or whatever is going to these events. Are they free to attend? You have to register, you know, as somebody who hasn't gotten to that level, is it, is it worth attending that stuff? Even if you're, you're very new to the sport. Yeah, if it if if there's an event like that, like near your area, um, for one, you're supporting that local area with, you know, their event they're trying to put on, obviously, but also like, you never know, like, if you're, say, a beginner and go into something like that, um, I, th I think it's beneficial, you'll connect with the community, um, you might, you know, meet some uh, bike companies that you might want to, you know, work with in the future or you know ride their product you know you get to hands-on experience um yeah so, some of them cost obviously and uh some of them are free i i believe the bentonville bike fest i think it was like i don't know 30 bucks or something for okay. the weekend something like that it wasn't super expensive but um yeah i i think it's worth to attend just to kind of um be vulnerable to the community and just you know, see what it has to offer. I, I used to be in a longboarding when I was in high school and there was a push marathon I did, which is essentially just ride your, ride your longboard the distance of a marathon. And then afterwards they had a, like a downhill jam fest where people just bomb hills, slide and everything. And yeah, it was just so cool to see people come from all over the state. This was pretty small, all over the region to come together and just, you know, chill and jam out on a sport like that so you're saying twenty thousand. that's that's nuts i would have to imagine that there's people from all over the world and just a lot of good energy of people hyping up you know mountain biking something that they all love yeah it was it was insane um there was uh, a a lot of pro athletes at that at the bentonville bike fest um they had like a huge jump jam set up and they had like trials riders doing all the crazy stalls and um jumps between logs things like that and uh they had like a couple races there and things like that and yeah it was uh definitely cool to see like how world worldly it felt pretty much um but yeah yeah if you ever get to go to an event like that definitely check it out I actually did a gravel race recently, which I know is a little bit off. I did a gravel race on my mountain bike and that, that was, that was pretty fun. It was, it was me just wanting to train towards something. And I'd, I'd completed a marathon. That was a bucket list goal of mine. I saw that there was this 50 mile bike ride. I knew it would be easy with my, not easy, but I knew I, I could do it with my marathon background. So I jumped into this thing and that was very funny because everybody had all their intense gravel bikes their road <laughs> yeah. bikes and everything and i'm i'm wearing a skateboarding helmet with this you know old specialized bike and you know did did totally fine um you mentioned these events and that's something that was really cool for me because i i looked that up i found that and you just get that that hype that sense of com community and competition is there for people that want to get started you know is there any bikes that you'd recommend is there different style bikes that that they should you know get to start with uh you know what what i guess what do you look into a bike and when do you care about certain features yeah so i mean if we we're talking about some of the, like the flatter trails that we have um or you know say say you wanted a, an intro into mountain biking um honestly like barrier to entry, you're probably looking at a hard tail, which is uh, no suspension in the rear and uh, a front fork up front. And uh, so that's the most cost effective way to break into the sport. Um, I would say when you start getting comfy, I, it depends on what kind of terrain you have around you as well. So like if you wanted to ride a lot of skate park stuff, the, the bike behind me, um, I ride for this local bike company out of Cleveland called Trilogy Bicycles, and that's called a dirt jumper. So basically it's kind of the same as a hardtail. It has no suspension in the rear and it has a front fork. And uh, 
it's kind of like a big DMX bike. And that's what a lot of people ride at Rays uh, are these dirt jumpers. And it's just kind of more comfy and like some taller people kind of gravitate more towards these than like a general BMX bike. Um, but so if you want to kind of level up your mountain biking, um, start with a hardtail, um, depending on what kind of terrain you have around you. So if you have, um, if you have some like pretty gnarly hills or, you know, even mountains, um, you might want to try to get into a full suspension bike first, but, um, a general rule of thumb, a lot of people start out on a hardtail. Um, and then, you know, you can get, uh, you can get into a full suspension for around 1500 to two grand. Um, and then just keep going from there. And like, if you start liking it a lot, then you can go for the bigger, bigger budget bikes, but, um, just, just kind of get into it and, you know, don't break the, break the wallet in half yet. Just, you know, just have fun riding at first and like, see if you, you know, fall in love with it and, uh, go from there. And I'll, I'll kind of share my experience. I, I walked into a store and I just said, you know, I'm looking to spend about 500 bucks. What's your entry level bike? And they yeah. walked over to one, you know, here, here you are. There's a $500 one. If you spend an extra hundred bucks, you can get disc brakes. And I really re wish I spent the extra hundred bucks because having those, those like drum brakes is yeah. nobody uses them. They're kind of a pain in the ass. Uh, you know, that's what I get for going cheap, but that thing has lasted me and I've done some pretty gnarly stuff on it. Like I said, I've broken an axle. I've, I've bent stuff. I have replaced the gear set. And now that that thing is as old as it is, what I would probably do next is still get a hardtail, but get those disc brakes and I'd even there's like gear ratios you can have. I would even drop the, you know, the front gears. Mm -hmm. Um, and if, if you don't know if this, if you guys are new to this, you have gears that you can shift on the left side, which is your front brakes and gears on the right side, which is your back, uh, not brakes, but your, your back gearing system. And it's just like, it is a, in my opinion, a pain in the ass having to worry about both of them. So I would probably just get something for the rear and that's just my personal preference. Um, and then there's yeah. also like tire sizes, right? You can get, yeah. I think there's three sizes and I don't have an opinion on those. I think I have the medium, the bigger makes it easier to get over stuff, but it's also, you know, weight to throw around. Do you have any opinions on, on gears or on a, leveling up your, your gearing? Cause I know that as you spend more money, they just get smoother and everything. And then do you have any comments on tire size? Yeah, it's it's kind of funny that you say that. Like, I remember I was in the same exact position as you. I was at the bike shop when I was looking to, at that five hundred dollar truck. I'm like, man, another two hundred. I could have some hydraulic disc brakes, but you know what? Nah, I'm good. Um, it depends like what situation you're in at that point. But um, yeah, so that's what's cool. So there is a YouTube channel. Um, it's called Berm Peak now, but a lot of people know it as Seth uh seth spike hacks and he's built like a lot of just he's taken walmart bikes or even like uh rei bikes like ozark trail bikes things like that like just really low level mountain bikes and he's like made them nice and he shows you like what you can do with a budget bike i guess you could say um and like there is a lot of stuff you could do like you could you could even uh so you're saying like you don't like the front derailleur setup um like shifting like uh the three gears um a lot of the bikes don't come li like that these days but some of those more budget bikes do but you could actually get like an upgrade so you could just make it a one by and it's usually mm -hmm. i think like a one by 12 in the back so um there's little tweaks uh depending on what type of terrain you ride like you're saying the three tire sizes um it depends on what you're riding but some people prefer um fat tire bikes which are just really big tires for um when they don't have suspension on their bike so it's like it's really tailoring your bike to what you need it to do and like you can you can make one of those budget bikes nice um i think the most important upgrades that you can do on a bike if you can i would definitely like recommend getting a dropper seat post um that's something that's super big like especially if you're just starting to ride with your buddies that like have already gotten to that step and you're still riding like a hard tail with like no way to get that 
that seat out of the way when you're going downhill. You can go, you could ride that bucking Bronco down that thing. If you hit a rock <laughs> and you get that seat up the butt, it just pitches you forward. So, um, yeah, so dropper seat post, I would say, is a recommendation and um, brakes for sure. I think those are probably the two most important upgrades. And then, like, when you need some more forgiveness, um, I would look into suspension after that, um, especially if you're starting to jump more, things like that. Suspension super important. I remember the first time I saw a dropper post, I was, I was so confused. What? Why? Yeah, it's to to a person that doesn't know anything like about bikes or like did your seat just go up like i've actually had people like just riding around the park just doing wheelies and stuff with my brother and, like people are like what happened to your seat it's like down now i'm like i was i was looking over because my bike's right next to me uh but uh i'm like yeah it's just magic you know you just just tell people it's magic don't worry about it yeah Keep don't up. worry about what i got going on in here you kind of mentioned that there's there's different riding trains and you've gotten some experience going to different states. Is there anything notable about like East Coast, West Coast riding or or you know, different regions? Yeah. So one common factor is I've noticed the mountain bike community is awesome. And wherever you go, there's always someone that's like willing to help you out, especially on the trail. Even like so I would say on the west coast people seem to to kind of know what's going on um more because it's just more prevalent out there but i mean the east coast is is firing off on mountain biking as well there's some really really nice spots to mountain bike on the east coast as well i mean if you can go up into vermont uh down to north carolina um uh, like western north carolina uh unfortunately you know near Asheville, which that whole mess just happened down there which was insane um their trails have definitely have to be hurting right now a little bit um uh but uh yeah so i've been on either coast and even down south and um i would say it's all generally like anyone's willing to help you out so like say if you're pulling up to the trail for the first time don't be hesitant to ask anyone for help like hey like honestly as a mountain biker that has been riding some of the local trails for so long i'd rather someone ask me because some of these trails are directional um so three or four days out of the week you'll be riding so it'll say like monday wednesday friday sunday like goes this way well some people like sometimes the signs are small or something and you won't know and you'll just have someone coming head on on you as you're going really fast um so like it's almost better like in some of those situations like don't be afraid to ask. And I, I think the community is willing to help you out like with anything, if you need a tool, um, we don't, we don't want to see anyone walking their bike like three miles out of the woods if, if we can help it. So yeah, I, I, I think that's uh, what's a, a constant across the whole country. It's funny that you mentioned that because you, you buy this bike and then you realize you have to get a helmet and like a repair kit and you know, do you, do you want to get a bottle? upgrade or carry it on your bag or whatever but because this is a sport similar to snowboarding whatever you're in you're in the zone you're in the moment you don't really have a sense of time it's not like you're driving to work and you see someone with a flat tire on the side of the road and you cannot be bothered to go stop and help them i always feel guilty when that happens even if i'm <laughs> yeah, heading nowhere here. important but yep. with with biking you know everyone's there you, you blocked off a bunch of time it doesn't matter if you finish the right the the route or not you're just there to have a good time chill bullshit about the sport and yep i i mean i've seen that everyone everyone wants to talk everyone wants to hear what's going on and everyone's willing to help um so that i think that's a really cool one that you mentioned yeah i i agree like even even recently like my my buddy of course we get to the farthest point of the trail and he breaks his chain and luckily like i usually carry a few things with me just in case things like that happen so i happen to have a different link or like a, another link um that he can link his chain back together but um even that like three people asked like as we were sitting there trying to like hey you guys good you like you need any tools or anything like i think that's that's so cool um that people were just it, it like restores your faith in humanity a little bit it's just like that's cool that people are willing to help each other um in and it's just for fun too like it could be the same scenario on the road like uh like you're saying someone changing their tire and just like oh 
I need to get gas a little quicker. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, I think that's cool. Yeah, that, that's great, Alan. I, is there anything else that you want to leave the listeners with? You got any final thoughts or tips or tricks to before we, you know, end this call? Yeah, I would honestly, I would say if you have a bike, just get out there and just see if you like it. Like if you're interested in mountain biking, um, there's a couple apps out there that can kind of help you figure out where some trails are. There's Trail Forks, uh, Mountain Bike Project. Um, there's a few apps. Um, there's a lot of like, that's the power of the internet these days. Like there's so many threads just like of beginner knowledge. There's YouTube videos, intro to mountain biking, things like that. Or, you know, look up local coaches near you. If you want to take this, you know, if, if you're serious about mountain biking and, um, you know, you want to take it to a pro level one day or something, maybe you can get connected with a coach, um, and just see where, you know, where that takes you. Um, I, I believe there's uh, skills clinics out there like uh, uh, that go across the country. I think one's like BICP. Um, there's another one that's uh, Ninja Mountain Biking Clinic. Uh, there, there's a couple that go like across the country. Um, but uh, yeah, check in your local area. And um, if you want to just have fun, then just just get out there and, and try it out. And uh, that's the most important thing is just just have fun with it. That's that's where it all stems from. And see if there's any clubs or anything you find you like this and need people to ride with. There is so many organizations on Meetup or just by doing a, a quick search or whatever. Yeah, even so, like uh, there's there's Facebook groups out there. I'm I'm yeah. part of like there's Ohio Mountain Biker. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's like a Michigan Mountain Biker, or like Michigan Mountain Biking things like that. And there are some great communities even on Facebook. There's Canva, Cleveland area Mountain Biking. Like just just look on. Uh, search, you know, your local area on Facebook and, you know, see what's out there. Awesome. Now you mentioned you have a couple sponsorships. Is there any shout outs that you want to give to to them or your friends or family? Yeah, I'd like to give a shout out to Tasco MTB for always uh, supporting me. And um, we, uh, I, I'm lucky enough to be able to, to work uh, right by their side and making some content. And, uh, I would like to give a shout out to uh, Trilogy Bicycles, the bike I have behind me. Go to TrilogyBicycles.com if you're looking for a dirt jumper. Um, Deity Components, uh, Tannis Armor, um, and uh, yeah, my family, everyone that supports me, all my followers. I really appreciate all the support I can get. So Excellent. And if, if you guys got any value out of this, if, if Alan inspired you to give this a shot or kind of level up, please hit that subscribe button on his channel or my channel. I'm trying to reach hundred subscribers with this, the small channel. And this is actually episode 50. So, you know, the grind is there. I'm, I'm having a blast talking to people like yourself, Alan, thank you so much for coming on. I hope you had a good time. I had, a, I had an awesome time. If, if you're ever looking uh, for a coach in the Cleveland area, um, go to shroupmtb.com and uh, check it out. So I appreciate your time today. And uh, thank you for having me on the type two podcast. Thank you for listening to the Type 2 Fun Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a follow and feel free to reach out to say hello, give feedback, or share your Type 2 Fun story.